All parents know that preschoolers have some very odd ideas. Tonight, this will glow in the dark, Emma. Not as we've already seen about how the world works, but about what they and others think. I'm not trying to pick In fact, even parents don't realize what a very strange mental world little kids inhabit. All right, you know what? This is University of Toronto psychologist Philip Zalazzo about to play a card game with three-year-old Jonathan. The object of the game is to see if Jonathan can sort the cards using a simple rule. And in the shape game, if I show you a boat like this, I want you to put it into this box. But if I show you a rabbit like this one, I want you to put it over here. Look, here's a red boat. Which box does that go in? OK. Boats go here. Rabbits go there in the shape game. Look, here is a blue rabbit. Which box does that go in? In here. OK. Let's do it one more time, OK? And then we'll play a new game. If it's a boat, it goes here. But rabbits have to go in that box. Jonathan's Look, got this game all this figured out. Rabbit. But now Phil changes the rules. Yeah. OK. All right, now, you know what? We're going to play a new game. We're not going to play the shape game. We're going to play the color game. In the color game, if I show you a blue one, you have to put it in this box. But if I show you a red one like that, then I want you to put it over here, OK? OK. All right, look at this. Here's a red boat. Which box does that go in in the color okay. game? OK, now you know what? Can you show me where do the blue ones go in the color game? Um, yeah. And where do the red ones go? Mm, here. So what about this blue rabbit? Which box does that go in? Here. Even though Jonathan has just repeated the rules with a new color game, he keeps playing by the rules of the old shape game. Now, the obvious explanation is that it's easier to sort by shape than color. So with Libby, Phil started with the color game, which she plays just fine. Okay. Now, now, Phil switches to the shape game. Can you show me where do the boats go in the shape game? And where do the rabbits go? Look, here's a red boat. Where does that go in the shape game? Libby, just like Jonathan and all the three-year-olds Phil Zalazo has tested, seems to get stuck on the first rule she learns. It's as if the three-year-old mind somehow doesn't know what it knows. We're going to have snacks now. What are you watching now? Nothing demonstrates that better than a simple but startling experiment Janet Astington, also at the University of Toronto, does with three-year-olds like Jacob and a juice box. What's in the box? Juice. Oh, look at that. What are they? Books. Hmm. Jacob calls the ribbons ropes which is fine, because it's the next question that counts. What did you think was inside the box before I turned it over? Ropes. Ropes. It's surprising when you think, well, surely they can remember. You know, if they just said juice a moment ago, it's really surprising when they say that they thought that there were ribbons in there. And you realize that they, they do, they just don't think about the world in the same way that we do. Okay. Sorry, Jacob. I just Not only is Jacob now convinced he always thought there were ropes in the box, he also believes if he thinks something, so must everyone else. Jesse hasn't seen inside this box. What would Jesse think is inside before I turn it over? Ropes. The innocence of the three-year-old mind is both wonderful and a little spooky. And it's led Toronto's Tom Keenan and David Olson to play an elaborate game to find out if young children understand deception. One of the players is three-year-old Ross. So, this is John, and this is his big sister, Katie. And that's John's mother, John and Katie's mother. And I want you to pretend that they're real people, just like you and me, OK? Yeah. Now look at John. John has big feet. And Katie, Katie has little feet. Now watch what happens when they walk through the flower. They make footprints. OK. Do you see the footprints they make? Now, can you tell me which footprints are John's footprints? Which ones did he make? That's right. Those are John's footprints. OK, now, can you point to Katie's footprints? Which ones did Katie make? Very good. OK, now, what we're going to do is I'm going to tell you a little story about Katie and John. 
but I just have to take their shoes off. The story takes place in the family's kitchen. Mom spilled flour all over the floor while baking the muffins that John and Katie now can't wait to eat. So they ask Mom if they can have some muffins. But Mom says, you can't have muffins right now. Dinner's almost ready. So Katie and John go back to their bedroom. Now, Mom hears the phone ring. So she goes downstairs to answer the phone. And when she's downstairs, she can't see us and she can't hear us, OK? OK, now, you know what Katie does? Katie decides she's going to take some muffins. So here comes Katie. But before she takes the muffins, she puts on John's great big shoes. Tom spells out for Ross exactly why Katie switches shoes. So here goes Katie. She put on John's shoes so she'll leave big footprints in the flour and so that the mum will think John took the muffins. OK? So here she goes. Now Katie grabs the muffins and she eats them all up. Now Katie hears her mother coming back, so she runs off to the bedroom. And here comes Mom. Now Mom sees that the muffins are all gone. And Mom also sees the big footprints in the flour. Now, can you tell me who ate the muffins? Which one ate the muffins? Was it Katie or was it John? Katie. Right. Did Mom see Katie eat the muffins? No, she didn't, did she? OK, now are there big or little footprints in the flour? Are those the big ones or the little ones? Big ones. They're the big ones, OK. So they're John's. OK, so <laughs> who will Mom think ate the muffins? Will she think it was Katie or will she think it was John? Katie. OK. Despite apparently following the logic of the story every step of the way, Ross still can't see that Mom doesn't know what he knows. This belief that thoughts in your head are somehow public knowledge that what you think, everyone thinks, is almost the definition of childish innocence. Watch this wonderful example with psychologist Joan Peskin and three-year-old Jacob. You're going to choose one of the stickers, and he's going to choose one of the stickers. But he always chooses first, and he always wants the one that you really want. He doesn't care if you're sad. Let's put Monkey into another room so that he doesn't know which sticker you really want. Okay. You tell me, which sticker do you really like? Which sticker do you not want? Okay, now I'm going to bring back Mean Monkey and he's going to choose first. Remember, he always wants the sticker that you really want he doesn't care if you're sad. So think of what you can do or say so that he doesn't get the one that you really want. Here comes Mean Monkey. Hmm, which sticker am I going to choose? Um, Jacob, which sticker do you really want? Oh, well then I'm going to take that one. So you get to take this one. Joan repeats the experiment several times with each child, giving them ample opportunity to deceive the monkey as to what they really want. OK. Tell me which sticker you really like. That one. And which sticker do you not want? That one. OK. Um, Jacob, which sticker are you going to take? Well, then I'm going to take that one. And you Bravely have... accepting, three-year-old Jacob never figures out that the monkey can be fooled. But what about Patrick, 18 months older, and already with a knowing gleam in his eyes? So that he doesn't know which sticker you really want, OK? Which one do you really like? Point to which one you really like. That one. And which sticker do you really not want, which is a yucky sticker? That one. OK, we'll leave those stickers there, and I'm going to bring in Mean Monkey. Hmm, let me see which one I want. Patrick, which one do you really like? Oh, well, then I'm going to take that one, and you get to have that one. I have my fingers crossed. <laughs> Patrick has also crossed a threshold into the adult world. 
He's now old enough to know that he can think things that others don't, that his thoughts are his alone. From about four and a half to five, they suddenly and rapidly get that knowledge. They begin to think about other people's thoughts. They begin to think that somebody can think something different from what they know, that people's thoughts vary, are private, um, may be incorrect. People can have false thoughts about something that they know to be true. Once you understand that, then you can explain all sorts of things about why people do things which seem strange to you. They're looking for things and you know that that's not where they are. It also means then that you can understand how to surprise people, how to trick people, because once you've made this split between the mind and the world, then you can think about people's minds and manipulate the way the world is so that they come to believe certain things about it. Teachers, parents, and grandparents are endlessly trying to fathom the minds of the very young. It's no wonder we find it so fascinating and so frustrating. They really are not like us at all.